I don't believe that we can necessarily convince racists through, through reason or through shame. I think we have to crush them politically. Being woke too often these days is just a matter of turning and doing high fives with people who think like you and not being concerned with doing the work and thinking about what really helps people. We continue to have a society that is divided and unequal in, racist, in racial terms. And those inherited racial inequalities do come from a deep past that we have never properly reckoned with in public policy or in our public history. Virtue signaling now stands in for being politically concerned. A person who in 1965 would have said, what can I do to help, is now asking, how can I show that I'm a moral person? But that's more Martin Luther than Martin Luther King. I just made that up just now. There. Welcome to this fifth, th to this third debate, rather, of the third season of the Soho Forum at the Subculture Theater in downtown Manhattan. I'm Gene Epstein, director of the Soho Forum. Tonight's resolution reads, the message of anti-racism has become as harmful a force in American life as racism itself. We do Oxford-style voting, as most of you know. Uh, we, uh, th the initial vote is the baseline, and whoever moves the vote in his or her favor uh, wins, uh, technically wins uh, the debate. Uh, well, while you're thinking about uh, that uh, resolution, uh, I just want to uh, thank you all, thank those of you who, uh, who attended our big gala socialism debate at the uh, John Jay Theater. Uh, we did get uh, nearly 500 people to show up, uh, many of them socialists, uh, and so we were very pleased by that. We needed, in other words, a much larger place to accommodate that crowd. Uh, uh, it was a debate that uh, I participated in taking the negative. Technically, I did win, and uh, I want to thank all of you who, uh, who complimented me on how it went. Uh, the, uh, it's been 21 days since the re Reason released the YouTube video, and we've had 28,000 views of that video, which is the second highest we've ever had. Uh, the third highest was 16,000 in our debate in education. The first is our absolute outlier. The highest of all was 355,000 views for a Bitcoin debate. Bitcoin debates clearly attract a lot of people. But we did, certainly did well on our socialism debate. I had four separate invitations to appear on podcasts to be interviewed about the debate. Uh, I did make, for those of you who haven't seen it, I did make the novel argument that socialists do not have to abolish capitalism in order to achieve a socialist economy. Uh, it's actually quite a, 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 a pedestrian argument, obviously enough, obvious enough, but rather novel, certainly from the standpoint of my debating opponent, Bhaskar Sankara. I do want to take to, to heart two criticisms that I received about the way the debate went. On the one hand, uh, a few days after uh, I uh, did the debate, I went to a conference and a bunch of young guys surrounded me. They'd been there and they told me, you were on fire, you killed it, you crushed it. I almost felt sorry for the guy. And uh, that was good to hear, but then I did say, uh, well, guys, it's probably a mistake to make uh, people feel sorry for your debater, your debating opponent. Maybe I was a little bit too much on fire uh, and killed it a little bit too much. Uh, and so I do take to heart those critics who said, you lost it a little bit. Uh, I guarantee you that I wasn't doing this in any tactical or conscious way. I think in a way I was hectoring my younger self when I started yelling at Bhaskar Sankara uh, that he should read up on economics and possibly appreciate the point that he can make the revolution right now. But I promise you that I'll do, try to do better the next time and recognize that it doesn't pay uh, to, uh, to lose it. 
uh, to some degree as I did. Uh, I also, I mean, the other criticism was that maybe I was stepping into the uh, debating ring, so to speak, with a uh, with a lightweight. He's only 29. I mean, he does he is indeed the editor in chief of Jacobin Magazine. He's got a book contract with Basic Books, a very prestigious labor label. He is going places. But um, I'm now in talks with a guy named Richard Wolf, who's in his 70s, a, 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 an emeritus professor at UMass, publisher of many books on the importance of socialism, and possibly next October, only every October will we do outreach to socialists, I'm going to have another debate on socialism with, uh, in this case, uh, Richard Wolff. Uh, I, uh, I also want to announce uh, that uh, what you see also on your, on your chair uh, was, is the 50th anniversary edition of Reason Magazine. I've read it cover to cover. It really is a delight and a collector's item. Uh, I don't know, is, uh, if Nick, Nick Gillespie's in the house, uh, Nick, do you want to come to the stage for a moment and talk about it, or you're not in the mood? Nick? I would rather not. Nick would rather not. You're welcome. Okay, t take a copy and read it. Nick has a, f a fun article in it about the whole Earth catalog. Some of you are old enough to remember it. I certainly am. Published at the same time that Reason was. It's got a rollicking article about Lanny Friedlander, the, the slightly uh, loony guy who started Reason 50 years ago. And uh, so somebody brought me up short recently and said, well, why else, else is it called Reason? It's called Reason because it was created by, by an objectivist, an Ayn Randian, as indeed it was. Uh, it's, uh, it's gone a bit eclectic since then in terms of the Ayn Rand enthusiasts, but Lanny Friedlander definitely did call it reason uh, in, in the spirit of Ayn Rand. Anyway, uh, I do recommend that uh, you take it home and uh, once you finish it, give it to your socialist friends to read as well. Uh, now, um, uh, at uh, all SOA forums, we do uh, want uh, to have our warm-up act. Uh, that is Dave Smith. Uh, who uh, puts out the show Part of the Problem. Uh, Dave, uh, I hope you're in the audience, and I hope you can come to the stage to teach us how not to be part of the problem. Oh, thank you, Gene. What's up? How is everybody? We're back at the Soho Forum without all those commie bastards. This is, uh, um, woof, that was fun, but you know, I'm over it at this point. If any of you people heckle me, I'm fist fighting you outside after this. I, that was a fun one. Congratulations, Gene, on your dominant performance. Welcome back, Jane, everybody, who just had a baby, is back with us today, so congrats. Yeah, clap, you animals. Get a baby. I'm really just saying it because my wife is eight and a half months pregnant, and I want you guys to clap for me when I come back after that. But yeah, she could go any time now. But I, as I told people in the back, if she, if she d like calls me and says my water just broke, I'm not leaving the debate. I'm just like, sorry, this isn't a good time for me. So I don't know what to tell you. It is hard, it's hard being like married, when your wife's pregnant, it's like a weird time, because it's so much that they go through, and you're just kind of there. You know, right? Jane? Like, it's like, it's kind of like you're like a Yankee fan, and she's Derek Jeter. <laughs> and you're just the person who did this to Derek Jeter. <laughs> and every now and then you're like, can I get you another pillow, Derek Jeter? And then you're like, why is Derek Jeter furious at me right now? I don't know. But anyway, it's all... All right, sorry, the topic at hand, racism. Personally, I'm against it, but let's have the debate and see <laughs> what happens. I don't know. <laughs> I'm a, I uh, am against racism because, you know, I'm a Jew. And, of course, I don't want anyone to hate blacks because if you hate black people, you also hate Jews. Those are the rules, <laughs> all right? There's never been anybody who hated black people and didn't also hate Jews. Like, there's never, like, a guy who's like, you know, the problem is these blacks. And you're like, what do you think of the Jews? And they're like, good people. Nothing against that. Like, we're always dragged into that shit, too. So, just for self, you know. I don't think racism is really that big of a problem today. I mean, I have it on good authority that Donald Trump is going to do tremendously great things for the black community. So, yeah. Donald Trump said that himself. So, you know it's true. If you can... Did you hear uh, Donald Trump said, and this is a direct quote, he said that in his re-election campaign in 2020, he is going to carry 95% of the black vote. It was actually the most modest thing Donald Trump has ever said. <laughs> he acknowledged 5% might still go the other way. But do you, do you remember back in, uh, in 2016 
when Donald Trump said uh, his pitch to the black uh, voters was, what do you have to lose? Do you remember that? When he was just like, you're living in squalor. <laughs> like, what do you have to lose? Vote Trump. <laughs> that was the greatest pitch I've ever heard in my life, a politician. I, my white liberal friends were so outraged. Like, they were so, that is the most racist thing ever. They have nothing to lose. And then I talked to one of my black friends, and he was like, makes a pretty good point. And I was like, you know what? It's, this shit might work, after all. I don't know. Racism isn't, isn't good. Um, sometimes it works out. I was, one time, I was, uh, this is like 10 years ago, and I was in Toronto with another friend of mine, a comedian, and we were on traveling, doing shows in Toronto. And, uh, you know, I was young. I was in my 20s. And uh, so was he. And he was like, hey, you know what would be fun on this trip is if we got some weed. And I was like, I agree, sir, because we spoke proper English back then. <laughs> and, um, and he goes, uh, he was like, we should try to find some weed. And then my friend Justin, he goes, uh, he was like, I'm going to ask that big black bouncer outside the strip club if he knows where we can get weed. And I was like, whoa, dude, that's a little racist. Um, but in Justin's defense, not only did that guy know, he was selling weed. So we ended up buying weed from that guy. Worked out well that time. I'm just saying, it wasn't cool, but it did work out pretty, pretty effectively at that point. Uh, but it was, yeah, my friend Justin just like charged right up to him, and I was like, I don't think we should do this. And he was like, hey, bro. And I was like, don't call him bro. Like, what? And he was like, you know where I can get some weed? And this bit, he was like, big black dude, you know, bouncer. And he, was, he, goes, uh, he goes, are you guys cops? And I was like, no, we're not cops. We're comedians. We're performing down the street. And then he just like, I didn't say it. He goes, are you guys cops? And I was like, no, I just said, we're not cops. And he goes, you guys are cops, right? And I was like, we should just leave. This isn't going to work out well. And then I said, no, one more time. And then he just pulled out a huge bag of weed in the middle of the street, in the middle of the Toronto street. And I was like, I guess three times is the charm. Now that's all. <laughs> like... Like, if we were real cops, the third time would have got it, you know? <laughs> I'm like, you cops? No, no. And they're like, you're cops? You're like, ah, you got me, I'm a cop. All right, all right, get out of here. But anyway, wherever that guy is in the world, thanks for getting me weed 10 years ago. Appreciate that. So I do, you know, I wouldn't call myself an expert in black culture, but I did, I got a haircut at a black barbershop once in my life. It was an accident, but it happened. <laughs> And there's another story, this is the life of a comedian. I was always on the road, and uh, I was in like, I don't even remember where, I think it was Memphis or something, but I needed a haircut, and there was just a sign that said barbershop, and I didn't know what it was. It was like in this mall, and, and I walked in, and then I realized it was a black barbershop, like as I got in there, but it was too late, because <laughs> I was already there. And there was like this, this big, jacked up black dude wearing a wife beater and like a huge gold chain and he I walked in and the conversation that I that literally I interrupted he was talking to a friend of his and he was like so I told that motherfucker I'll kill you and then he looked over and was like can I help you and I was like <laughs> oh man what did I just get myself into and I was like I think I'm just gonna take off and then he just like black guy bullied me into getting a haircut. He was like, sit down, motherfucker. I'm like, okay, I'll sit down, no problem. And, uh, and I sat down, and he was like, uh, he was like, so what do you want? And you know, I was like, I don't know, I'll just take a little off the top. And then he said the most terrifying <laughs> words that my white ears have ever heard in my life before a haircut, which is he goes, so you want like a scissor haircut? And I was like, this isn't gonna work out well. <laughs> And uh, it didn't. It did not work out well at all. He pulled out a pair of scissors that looked like they came with the barbershop when they opened <laughs> the barbershop. Like, no one's ever used these here before. And he was like, it was like he was just guessing. Like, you're just like, I don't know. I'm going to cut this off. And, and I was like, thank you. And, uh, and I left. But that's all I got. That's my experience with black culture. I'm sorry. I, no. No, I'm just kidding. I grew up in Brooklyn. There's every race of culture. That's what racism never even seemed like a real thing to me. But I guess it is a real thing. Like, every now and then, that's, like, the thing, like, you learn is, like, because I'm a Jewish kid from Brooklyn, so it's not like people are really, like, it's all just, like, a joke to me, the idea of, like, open bigotry. But then when I started going throughout the country, you're like, eh, there's there's a little bit of it out there. Like, I used to always think it was crazy. It was just something left-wing people made up. Like, there's no there's no racism in this country. And then it's kind of, it's been 
brought up to the surface a little bit in the last few years, you know? Like, I, like the left-wing people would always call, like, Trump supporters Nazis. So you're like, there's no Nazis, you know? And then they had that Charlottesville thing. And I was like, there might be a few. Like, there might be a couple of them out there. I don't know. I, like, they're not Nazis. They're just conservatives, you know? And he's like, that guy's got a swastika tattoo on his neck. And you're like, okay, he's on the edge. Like, that guy might be a little bit. But I still just laugh at it. I don't know why. I just laugh at Like, even in the, in the Charlottesville thing, when they were chanting, the Jews will not replace us. At, like, I'm a Jew. I've, that was the most empowered I've ever felt as a Jewish person <laughs> in my entire life. And they're up there like, the Jews will not replace us. Like, look, I have never in my wildest Jew fantasies, entertained the idea of replacing anybody. We simply don't have the numbers. But then you saw all these fucking angry Tiki Torch guys and they're like, the Jews will not replace us. And I was like, you know what? I think we can replace these motherfuckers. Like, I think we can do this. We just get our act together. Let's strike now, Jews. All right, you guys are great. Enjoy the debate, everybody. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Gene.